Good morning. My name is Jerome Shang, and I'm the chairman of the Young Professionals Program of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Our topic today is whether international organizations are becoming obsolete. Now, before we dive in, I have to cover a few logistical issues. For those of you joining us online, we will be taking questions from you in about 20 minutes. You should see a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen with an area for questions that you can type into. When the Q&A portion starts, we will be joined by Claire Krellitz, the Council's Marketing and Communications Director. Claire will read your questions and endeavor to get to as many as she can in the time that we have. Our speaker today is Katarina Linos, Professor of Law and Co-Director of the Miller Institute for Global Challenges in the Law at the University of California, Berkeley School of Law. A research on law reform, policy innovations, and international organizations appears in leading academic journals. Her first book, titled The Democratic Foundations of Policy Diffusion, How Health, Family, and Employment Law Spread Across Countries, has won numerous prizes. She holds both a JD and a PhD from Harvard University, and she was a, ju uh, she was a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows. And on a personal level, I'm particularly excited to have this conversation today with Katarina because she was on my dissertation committee when I was at Berkeley. And I think it is a unique feeling and opportunity to be interviewing your old boss, especially on a topic that she knows so well. Professor Linos, Katarina, thank you for joining us today. Now, I'd like to get us started, uh, get this discussion started by setting the stage for our audience with a couple of basic questions. And I think these questions will sound very simple, but I think the answer will actually be a little bit complex. What are international organizations exactly, and where did they come from historically? Let me start by saying what a pleasure it is for roles to be reversed and for a former student, a star student with a, an, a dissertation from Berkeley to be inviting their mentor to an event like this, to be practicing intellectual property, to be leading the World Affairs Council Young Professionals Group. Uh, I couldn't be more thrilled to be here. Let me start with what international organizations are. International organizations are groupings of states. Um, at least three states need to be present for an organization to be called truly international. And the goal is for this organization to be pursuing truly shared goals. That is, we don't want a body such as a foreign ministry of a single country to be directing the organization. That's the minimal definition, but typically international organizations have some pragmatic features. One such feature is a secretariat, an independent body that makes routine decisions as well as policy making drafts. Another common feature is an effort to bring in as much of the international community as possible uh, to aim towards universalism. And there are still other common features such as separation from national capitals, a pledge civil servants take to further the common goal rather than the direction of a, a single um, member state. Where international organizations come from is also a fascinating question. Uh, our modern infrastructure mostly dates to the uh, World War II reconstruction efforts. That's when the UN and most of the bodies we know best were established. Similar efforts were created uh, following World War I and the League of Nations. Uh, some bodies established then, such as the International Labor Organization, are still with us. International organizations have been surviving and proliferating, uh, but many of them have of centuries long history or decades long history. Now, I think that in this country, especially in the United States, there's sort of like a, a two different conceptions of international organizations that are held by uh, many people. It seems like on one hand, we have people who believe that international organizations are um, a global government almost, uh, that they have the power and the capacity to come in and overrule uh, the U.S. government, or really any government in the world. And then there is more of a, a, a separate conception, which I sort of call the, the Star Trek Federation <laughs> conception, where the international organizations are a place to practice multilateralism, to, to sort of come together and, and understand what the greater good is for, for the global commons and, and whatnot. Now, 
either of these conceptions seem to be maybe a little bit simplistic because maybe um, organizations are certainly more complicated than that. So can you speak a little bit as to sort of where, not necessarily in the hierarchy, but where do international organizations actually fall into in terms of who's making rules, what's going on in their relationship with various capitals around the world? Yes, let me start with the first conception that we have a supra government um, that is ruling us. The World Health Organization has been in the news recently because of the pandemic and its efforts and emissions have been controversial. The US has cut its contribution and China has stepped in. But when we think of the total budget of the World Health Organization, it is in the realm of $4 billion. A single US health agency, the NIH, has a budget 10 times as large, 40 billion. So if only because they are uh, very limited in size relative to what even a large national government would be, international organizations do not have the money, the staff, the regulatory authority to be um, functioning as world government. They depend very, very heavily on member states, on member state cooperation, on member state um, debate, on member state implementation. The only international organization that is perhaps moving in the direction of a global regulator for its member states is the European Union. Uh, but every other international organization is extraordinarily dependent on the goodwill, on the preferences, on the cooperation of sovereign states. So it, it it would be so that that's actually raises a very interesting question because um, states do get together and say we would like these multilateral international organizations to to help with certain issues that states can't solve on their own. Uh, to do so, they do have to give up some level of control, some level of power to these organizations. And so one of the questions I think that is uh, any any observer of international organizations might might be interested in is why do international organizations take the form that they do? Why do they all seem to look like certain types of bureaucracies? And why do they all seem to draw from certain groups of people when it comes to their staff and it comes to the people who are running them? Like what what beyond the political power that's given to them? What kind of power do these organizations have? Great. Um, as I mentioned, international organizations don't have money. The federal government wants to induce the states to do something and it can just tie funds and say, if you follow our guidance, more money will come to you. International organizations don't have that kind of power. They don't have military force. So they are reliant first and foremost on the power of information. They have this preeminent status and they know that when um, a UN Secretary General, a director of the World Health Organization speaks, the world will listen. Journalists around the world will cover what they have to say uh, and that power to establish what is appropriate, what is normatively desirable is a, a core source of power for these bodies that lack money and military force. They uh, maintain that power by being neutral and technocratic. If they started taking partisan positions, they would soon lose their influence. And it is uh, as bureaucracies that they also develop problems, but they are uh, primarily reliant on the power of information. Uh, one set of prominent scholars, um, Barnett and Finnemore described the international organizations as the missionaries of our time. They have an idea of what is good, a way uh, to convert people to this uh, notion, be it human rights or public health, and a process. So it is through information that international organizations exercise the influence they have. Okay, so you actually just uh, mentioned that it is through this bureaucracy and this role that the international organizations are playing that we can start to see some of the problems that they have in the modern world. Um, they were created uh, sometimes uh, 100 years ago um, in a world where maybe information was a lot less um, readily available even to national governments. And But today it seems like there are certain problems or pathologies that international organizations are exhibiting. So could you talk a little bit about um, what those might be? 
Yes, whenever we think of bureaucracy, we use it as a synonym for slow action for red tape. So when we have a pandemic, when we have a financial crisis, when we have a global event that requires immediate action, we are hopeful that a bureaucracy will act fast, but because of the procedures and steps necessary to reach consensus, especially among governments that have very, very different preferences, the pace of bureaucratic action is a key concern. One concern is that international organizations are all talk and no action precisely because they are bureaucracies. Another problem with bureaucracies is the idea of cookie cap cutter solution. Bureaucracies are better than the alternative, a system of clientelism and personal responses where people are awarded what they uh, are awarded based on a relationship alone and not based on some criterion. But uh, it, bureaucracies of all kinds, including international organizations, have a certain type of solution that they apply to that same problem, whether this problem occurs in Asia or Africa or Europe. And they've been um, they've been criticized for this. They've been criticized, for example, for imposing on Asian countries austerity measures that they had imposed on Latin American countries and which were thought to be highly inappropriate for the Asian context. So this idea that um, they have a hammer and they find nails everywhere is another criticism of international organizations. Now, is this a problem that stems from uh, something in the bureaucratic form of governance, or is it something that maybe could be fixed if we just find uh, different people to to run these international organizations? This is a great question because international organizations often have two types of staff, international staff and local staff. Uh, international staff are hired through uh, civil service type competitions and are encouraged to move from Geneva or New York to the field. Local staff are hired in particular countries where emergencies or other types of actions emerge. And there is a real question about whether someone who is an expert in finance or public health or development, uh, but moves to a country they are unfamiliar with can really implement their reforms. There's a real question about whether to the extent local staff are hired, some international organizations reserve uh, local staff for the low level positions. So while the drivers and the secretaries will be local, but the key decision makers will be international staff that have global expertise, but lack local insight. And I think another one of the concerns that some people may have is that some of these, uh, some of the people who are running these organizations, especially at the highest levels, uh, are on some level political appointees of various governments. And so when you have, say, a World Bank or, or an International Monetary Fund uh, that basically draw from the highest levels from Europe, America, and some of East Asia, uh, when they're going into uh, places in Latin America and Africa, Southeast Asia, um, how, how would we know that the, 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 uh, the, the appointing government's preferences are not the ones that are necessarily dictating uh, the actions uh, on the ground? This is, this is critical. So we know that international organizations have um, civil service like meritocratic type appointments up until a point. Uh, in the UN speak, there are, there are the P professionals and then the D professionals. And above a certain level, it is all politics. So uh, there are conventions by which the head of certain organizations will have certain nationalities, uh, usually the nationalities of key contributors, traditionally the United States and certain European countries. This is a problem. Uh, it is a problem uh, at um, first pass simply of the image of an international organization, even if you have the best American who happens to be the best qualified and the most internationalist still, it doesn't look good. Uh, often, as uh, Jerome emphasized, these are chosen by uh, governments that have particular ideologies, and they're chosen sometimes by the United States for their hostility to the international organization's uh, agenda. And there has been reform, there has been progress. We have um, 
starting with the UN Secretary General, uh, someone who is on the one hand European, but Portuguese uh, and known for his excellent execution of programs in his prior position. So it's not a, um, it is not someone who lacks this kinds of experience and would not have met the meritocratic uh, criteria. Uh, there is a little bit of shift, but the rate at which we're seeing change is much too slow given the global challenges. Right. So I think this we can pivot to the part where we talk about why uh, things are uh, not maybe working out for international organizations right now as a whole, which is precisely the, the problem with global political uh, challenges. Uh, we definitely live in a world in which developments happen very quickly. And we also live in a world where we have countries that formerly did not have the ability to influence some of these organizations. And they are now, uh, not only do they want to, they may want to form entirely new organizations for, for their own um, benefit. I think the primary mover on this is very clearly China. Um, and when we, since we are living in this world now, in which case essentially we're in a multipolar world where the United States or Europe can no longer dictate the outcomes. Uh, have we reached a point where the traditional international organization simply cannot move fast enough to deal with any sort of problems that may affect the globe as a whole? It is fascinating to see the shift from the early 1990s in which welcoming China into the World Trade Organization on the terms Westerners had designed uh, was the way we thought the future would go when we had a shift towards more and more democracy. And now we see a shift towards more and more authoritarian rule. It's also interesting to see how as economies develop, the entrenched preferences of particular states shift. So once where the rules for global trade favored manufacturing economies and those economies were located in Europe and North America, now the rules still favor manufacturing economies, but it is China that benefits tremendously from the existing set of rules, even though they were not designed with China in mind. As um, Jerome mentioned, the glacial uh, shift in international organization governance has meant that different groups of states have tried to form competitor organization. Chinese or BRIC-led financial institutions are one way in which we're seeing this contestation of power. Another way in which we're seeing Western states um, oppose the um, bureaucratic global development-led uh, approach of certain organizations is through competitor coalitions of the willing built around Europe and uh, the US. And this emphasis on competitor organizations and regional cooperation, I think is not all for the bad. I think there is a lot to, um, a lot to praise in organizations that are putting, putting pressure on existing infrastructures and saying, look, you are not serving our needs, uh, so we will build something different. I think there is, um, th there, there is good to be seen in those efforts. Now, I know that one of the fields in which, uh, I guess, states have long been used to sort of competitive uh, regional organizations, so to speak, is in international trade. Uh, and very specifically, recently, we had the, um, I guess, the two biggest ones in the Asia Pacific region with the Trans-Pacific Partnership and also uh, just last month, I believe. Uh, with RCEP that was led by um, the Association of Southeast Asian States as well as China. And these sort of mega regional uh, trade deals, um, they seem to be suggesting that the world is fracturing on some levels, that instead of handling everything through the multilateral organizations such as the World Trade Organization, they would rather have uh, 10 or 12 countries come together and then say, these are the rules that we're going to play by. And, and I mean, these the rules that they are coming up with, for example, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership about digital um, data rights and whatnot, these are these are these are the first time that uh, that some of these rules are being implemented across such a broad spectrum of countries. So is that danger of fracturing 
real? Or are we sort of seeing a transition period when we will see these regional groupings come together, but they'll still come back to playing nicely with each other? This is fascinating. Um, as you said, kind of the World Trade Organization once um, with a crown jewel, the appellate body is now in decline with the US refusing to uh, appoint judges and uh, trying to garner more control over a body at once designed and having that be replaced by the Trans-Pacific Partnership, by the European Union, by other types of bodies that are uh, deciding to offer their own uh, set of rules and their own competitive dynamics. I think we are living in an era where regional bodies will try to exercise global powers. Uh, one of these areas, as you mentioned, is data. The, who will be the global data regulator in the absence of a true global regulator is um, a really big question and different, uh, different approaches. Um, a privacy-focused European approach, um, state-controlled Chinese-led approach, and a market-led US-based approach are all uh, competing for global dominance. But in the absence of global regulation, I think it is best to see these competitive forces and see uh, where we will emerge, often following the breakdown of international negotiations and the rise of regional efforts we do see people coming back to the table uh, together. We do see uh, big successes. Uh, one such example is in aviation and emissions where the US went one way, China went another way. Uh, Europe tried to do something unilaterally and in the end we had uh, some progress in a global accord. I'm hoping that we'll see more um, efforts, more pressure put on states to say these regional approaches are better than nothing, but they're really not working and towards uh, global rules. So one of the perhaps, it, it's always risky to, to, in my mind, to connect domestic politics with something that happens internationally, because it's hard to tell which way the causation is, is going, I think. But um, I think the fact that we have very volatile politics in a lot of our democratic societies, whether it's Western Europe or even in East Asia and whatnot, makes it very difficult for international organizations to know what their marching orders really happen to be. So going back to the World Health Organization example, um, the different administrations of uh, presidents seem to have very different ideas as to what the proper role of the World Health Organization happens to be. And so in this environment, uh, when it's not clear whether we will have huge shifts between, say, a left government and a right government in some of the biggest countries in the world, how can international organizations actually navigate this in a way that uh, fulfills their mission? This is great, and it uh, brings us back to the conversation about bureaucracy. One of the things bureaucracies do is they're insulated. You come in and you ask for a favor and you say, sorry, we don't have favors, we have procedures, wait in line, we'll do what we always did. And this was the World Health Organization's response to the Trump administration, extraordinary demands, the U.S withdraws and thankfully a Biden administration will change all of that. But it is here we're having a core mission statement, a clear set of values as and an insulated bureaucracy really helps. Let me give you another example. I'll compare uh, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, which has a very, very clear protection mission to the International Organization of Migration, which just joined the UN as a related agency in 2016. The IOM doesn't have a clear mission. It says we're going to help migrants, we're going to help host states, and we're going to help sending states. And by lacking a clear mission, it is much more at the mercy of particular administrations that want uh, the IOM to help build detention centers or want the IOM to help with elections or want the IOM to do whatever it is uh, that particular administration want to do. So it is the better established, better funded, um, organizations with clearer legal mandates that are best positioned to withstand uh, shifts in political winds in particular countries. Okay, so uh, we're actually just gonna take uh, what, we're gonna do one more question and then hand it over to uh, the Q&A section. And I don't want to just, well, I'm gonna throw this out here because, and this was the original question, are international organizations obsolete? 
And it sounds like the answer that uh, you are giving us is that, well, they may have a different role to play. They may have a different role to play and they may have to do about, go about it in a slightly different way than they used to, but they are certainly not obsolete. Um, it's just they have to change with the times. So I know you are uh, an expert on the EU, so I do have to ask you, uh, with the UK leaving the EU uh, and having and, and sort of building a new conception of what it means to be part of, yes, they've left the EU, but they conceptually may not really have left in, in a lot of ways, pending whatever it is they're talking about right now. Um, how do we see... Uh, this sort of independently minded country, as they are trying to navigate a very strong multilateral, uh, sorry, international organization, and still trying to chart their own course. How, how should countries think about this without throwing the baby out with the bathwater? I'm so glad uh, we're ending with a Brexit. I think it's important to focus on what's happening in Britain and also what's happening in the remaining 27 member states. On the one hand, Britain needs to conclude or break away within a month and either be in a position where they become rule takers, that the EU position says you're not going to be able to participate in uh, rulemaking anymore, but if you want unfettered access to our market, if you want to continue to be so integrated, you have to apply these rules, a position that uh, Boris Johnson campaigned against and that is very, very difficult for any state to accept. But it's uh, also important to look at what's happening in the remaining 27 member states. Uh, not only are they uh, on better competitive playing field than uh, Britain is, so jobs are moving to uh, cities like Frankfurt uh, from uh, London, but also there is much stronger integration. At the time of the financial crisis, there were proposals about the issuance of joint debt such that the credit rating of uh, Germany could underwrite the obligations of the rest of Europe. That wasn't possible at the time. That was seen as too radical a step of integration. But when the pandemic hit, that was exactly what happened. And uh, Chancellor uh, Merkel put in place the kinds of reforms that were unimaginable a decade ago and required much tighter integration, uh, much more ability on the part of the richest and strongest states, Germany and France, to underwrite the pandemic responses uh, around uh, the continent. Uh, so right now, the worst fears around Brexit and other possible exits have not materialized. And there's also some good news in terms of stronger integration. OK, um, I find that really fascinating that, uh, that Brexit is something that was Sort of talked about in the news, especially as something that can start the cascading effect of breaking the EU apart, may have actually done the exact opposite for the rest of the countries. Okay, so um, now Claire is going to join us and she's going to read some of the questions that have been submitted. If you have a question for Professor Linos, uh, click on the questions section in your control panel and send them uh, to us and we'll try to get to many as we can. Claire, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great, thanks, Jerome. We have a lot of questions, so we'll work to uh, get through as many as we can. Um, and I think we'll start, uh, we have a lot of people interested in reform and regulation of international organizations. So the first question is, there are increasing calls for reform of major international organizations like the UN Security Council, Bretton Woods organizations, but how is re reform possible if most important original members show no interest in reform? Excellent question. So reform of the Security Council has been on the agenda for decades, and we have seen changes. We've seen an expansion of the Security Council, although the P5, uh, the veto-wielding members, remain the same. As uh, Jerome emphasized earlier on, when countries that are growing in power, such as China or Brazil or Russia get frustrated with the pace of reform when they've tried to change the voting in the IMF, uh, but it changes very, very incrementally. Building a competitor organization is sometimes effective. Uh, so to some extent, we have competitors to uh, the IMF and we've seen the power of the IMF reduced to the extent that certain governments will say, we will not borrow 
from the IMF, even if it is cheaper financing, because we disagree with the way this organization is run. So the building of alternative trade and finance organizations is one way in which we see uh, reform pressures. Uh, tighter regional integration uh, is a way we see reform pressures. And there's also efforts internally to reform international organizations. So when a big scandal happens, such as the UN introducing through its peacekeepers cholera, uh, to Haiti. Uh, there are efforts internally to make sure that this type of scandal does not happen again, that uh, the financing, the anti-corruption, the responsibility, the contracting is done at a better, uh, in a better way. Uh, that said, international organizations as established bureaucracies through which a handful of rich states have control are very slow to change. So those uh, reform efforts are not uh, keeping pace with a global need for reform. Thank you. How are these international organizations held accountable for how they manage their resources and policies? So one way in which international organizations differ from national governments is that they don't have the same kind of transparency and accountability um, mechanisms. The EU is an exception where you can request all kinds of documents online, but if you want UN documents and you are the um, special rapporteur on information transparency, you can't get them. This was the finding of David Kay, a UC Irvine professor, that we just do not have enough accountability and enough transparency. This is compounded by the fact that we don't have journalists situated at UN and other headquarters. So you would expect there to be journalists at every national capital trying to follow what's happening even in the least transparent states. Um, you would expect journalists in Harare, Zimbabwe, but you don't have a large uh, press corps in Geneva. You don't have a large uh, press corps in other cities where uh, international organizations are headquartered. So this is a, there's a real question about accountability and transparency and real scope for improvement. And, and sort of related, but but taking it an, a, another step, how are sanctions doled out for dishonesty and abuse within international organizations? Um, so there is the question of kind of the individual corrupt contractor or subcontractor, and there we can aggregate up to an international organization that has a misguided and catastrophic policy. Um, so there are, as in every bureaucracy, specialized processes, specialized employee uh, tribunals, whereby to the extent you've misused funds or you violated some other policy, some sexual harassment or some other policy, like there is a process there. I'm less concerned about that. What concerns me is that international organizations like states enjoy immunity. So to the extent a peacekeeping mission uh, or um, uh, the Haiti example is, is the biggest example, uh, a reconstruction mission ends up harming the country inadvertently or through through errors and omissions, there this legal doctrine means that the organization as a whole can shield itself from liability. Immunity is double-edged um, because other types of bodies say they will not enter development without it. So a competitor to the World Health Organization is the Global Fund. Uh, the effort there is to uh, solve the problems of AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And without immunity, uh, donors and, uh, from the private and public sector say, we're not going to enter this field at all. So you either give us immunity or you won't have these problems uh, solved. Uh, but there is a real question, um, I think, about accountability, not so much at the individual level and the misuse of funds and corruption um, you know, is occasionally investigated. Peacekeeping missions occasionally uh, go very wrong because again, it is a violent situation, but it is this overall direction of international organizations where more accountability could be advantageous. Great, thank you. Um, so this next person says, the idea of the descent of global organizations makes me concerned about shifting alliances that can result in war. 
such as the conditions that existed before World War I. What are your thoughts? Are you concerned? To the extent we have something to celebrate um, as kind of the biggest success of international organizations, it is peace in our times. I think when people complain about the EU being too bureaucratic or too um, uh, very much in the business of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, micro regulations, the answer is, but we don't have World War II. France and Germany are moving hand in hand. We don't have World War II type situations. And I think we're not, I'm not worried about World War III right now, but I think it is through global fora, through global cooperation that we are preventing uh, this type of conflict. Uh, it is well established that uh, countries that trade with one another, um, don't engage in conflictual behavior. So I think it is, I think we're not immediately descending into global conflict, um, but we've been protected from this in part through these global cooperative efforts, even if they're imperfect. What steps can you recommend for these organizations to be more nimble and act quicker than their structures re require? How can they avoid becoming irrelevant or obsolete? So there's two type of international organizations. One of them is the talk type international organization and the other one is the operational organization. So bodies, for example, like the UN are all about creating a forum where Chinese, Iranian, um, North Korean, American and French leaders can all come together and find peaceable solutions when otherwise negotiation would have broken down. Then there are a series of international organizations that are all about project implementation, uh, bodies such as UNHCR, where it's all about like moving these refugees to safety. Um, similarly, like uh, the UN Development Program, the World Health Organization have uh, some operational components. So the advice I think would be different depending on the mission of the organization. For the organizations that are about operations, I think a core recommendation uh, returns to something we were discussing with Jerome, which is hiring of more local staff. Local staff are much cheaper than international staff and have been underutilized. Their expertise and their familiarity with procedures and needs, I think uh, would be one way of making the organization and its operations more efficient, getting more buy-in, uh, getting less opposition and less protest. For example, if you want to do a vaccination campaign, uh, knowing how to involve the local community can save lots and lots of conflicts. For organizations whose core goal remains to be negotiation fora, I think um, what we might want to see is a little bit more boldness. Sometimes what we see with the UN are resolutions that after lots and lots of negotiations and compromise say nothing. On occasion, we have very clear, very ambitious and very resonant uh, talk. For example, the Millennium Development Goals told us very clearly where we want to be. And that type of information and goal setting uh, can be much more effective than um, resolutions that uh, are uh, vague and aspirational. In the European Union, what we see is the European Commission, the bureaucracy, putting before states proposals that are far more radical than what any member state is likely to agree to. Uh, but these get press coverage, they are uh, controversial, and then the conversation moves forward. We haven't seen that on the international organization level, and it's a possible step these bureaucracies could take to be more relevant. Great, thank you. Um, so this next person says, countries approach international organizations with different ends in mind. So you could see an opportunity for an imbalance when a smaller, less wealthy nation seeks involvement from the international organization. So how are less powerful nations ensuring that their voices and interests are heard and supported within the larger structure? So um, less powerful nations have numerical advantages on their side. So the group of 77 was one of the earliest uh, efforts to bring developing country voices into organizations that were dominated even more than they are today by Western states. 
since the idea of regional groupings has become dominant uh, around the international organization system. So to the extent there are some regional groupings that are very effective. So the Latin Americans and the Africans often come together and say, this is the African position, take us seriously. That works very well. That works less well, uh, for example, with Asian countries that don't have those kinds of same regional networks and regional coherent uh, positions. Great, thank you. Uh, this next question comes from another one of our young professional board members. So it's great to, great to see some of you on. Um, they say global central planning schemes like the World Economic Forum's Great Reset are met with great suspicion. Why can't they focus on pressing issues rather than an attempt to remake the world? I think right now we are, you're, thinking a lot about this question of crisis response versus prevention. What can we do now and what should we have done 10 years ago to build up our public health infrastructure? Um, remaking the world is a goal that is perhaps overly ambitious, although global development is all about that. How are you going to get more girls educated? How are you going to get uh, more people out of poverty? Uh, goals to which governments around the world now agree. So there isn't a single governmental leader who thinks what I'm supposed to focus on is the salvation of my people's souls, kind of a core goal in 18th century Europe. Instead, everyone is thinking GDP growth. And to the extent GDP growth is too limited, other measures of development. I think that thinking in these broad terms, imagining a day when certain diseases will be eradicated, imagining days when the world's population will all be out of poverty, uh, imagining days when climate change will be pre proceeding at a much less rapid pace than it is uh, proceeding now is appropriate for international organizations. The question is not so much in the setting of ambitious goals, but in identifying implementation mechanisms that are not going to meet the kinds of resistance some global coordination efforts have met. I think finding ways to work with sovereign states that at the end of the day have all of the power, all of the money, all of the knowledge is the core goal rather than setting up goals that are, that are too low. On the topic that you just brought up of climate change, this person is wondering, do you imagine a new organization uh, be created to deal with climate change at the level of the UN, which was formed in large part to prevent wars? I think the fact that we are lacking an international organization to deal comprehensively with environmental problems that UNEP is very small and not up to the task is a reason uh, for concern. It's a reason why um, the Paris uh, principles are so celebrated. They're a non-binding agreement where everything is voluntary and yet it's so much better than what we had uh, before. I don't know that we can move globally as fast as is necessary. I am really pleased that we've seen more local efforts. We've seen, for example, uh, individual U.S. cities, the state of California, the Europeans, uh, the Chinese all say, look, if we don't have global accords, we are going to move unilaterally to make sure uh, that we are reducing pollution and enjoying kind of the local benefits of that, uh, but also contributing to this global public good, even when we don't have an international organization and even when the accords we have are uh, lacking in ambition. Great, thank you. Um, this next person is asking for your advice. So what would your advice be to the UN to help increase global cooperation solely needed in uh, especially the next year, but also in the coming decade? This is a challenging question. I think a lot of diplomacy is face-to-face -face, and with the pandemic, we don't have our traditional relationship building exercises. We're doing what we can do through Zoom. And the question is, can we find a silver lining through this? Can we say, look, let's just put global leaders on the phone more. Let's create webinars like this, but 
uh, build on the fact that nobody needs to travel and we can conquer the time difference much more easily? Can we build cooperation? Can we uh, make lemonade out of this horrible hand that was dealt to us this year. We can't have the parties, the personal relationship, all of that, which lubricates uh, diplomatic relationships. But are there ways in which the widespread use of technology, the shift to uh, global um, education through these media can help us come uh, together. I understand, for example, that a World Affairs Council has had more audience participation precisely because people are stuck at home and able to access these talks uh, remotely without having to drive to a forum. So maybe maybe we can make uh, something out of this uh, social distancing and the shift to technological connection. Yeah, definitely we've benefited, I think, in some ways from people not having to sit through Los Angeles traffic. Uh, although, to your point, on our more localized scale, we miss that person-to-person uh, -person interaction and the ability to foster uh, community around ideas in a, in a different way. Um, uh, so on the topic of the COVID crisis, uh, how has the World Health Organization addressed the coronavirus pandemic? So um, there is now an investigation of how the World Health Organization addressed the global pandemic headed by Helen Clark, a former head of UNDP, because there are many concerns that uh, the UN acted too slowly, um, promoted policies that international organizations largely favor, such as open borders, for too long. That said, we have global data sharing in place. We have a longstanding cooperation among physicians who are ultimately um, the persons who are sharing data, who are implementing policies. We have a new vaccine um, that is uh, almost certainly likely to be approved around the world that is based on the fact that one uh, member state, China, was able to provide the genetic sequence of the virus within a month. So the pace of vaccine development is something to celebrate. We have a big challenge in terms of vaccine distribution. We will see um, how that goes, not only in the West, where I'm more confident, uh, but in much of the developing world, where I'm less confident that we have the money, that we have the uh, freezers, uh, that we have the distribution network. Vaccines are some of the biggest successes of uh, the World Health Organization and the UN system. The eradication of certain diseases is what we celebrate uh, the most. So uh, we'll wait and see. Uh, I think, but the existence of a vaccine at this point is a uh, cause for celebration, even though there is also an investigation and uh, we could have moved faster and quicker. Thank you. And this was a follow up to your previous answer, but on the topic of coronavirus, and I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but um, how long do you foresee uh, before we go back to travel, open borders and face-to-face -face diplomacy? I think in an optimistic scenario, we have mass vaccination in the West by the end of the summer. I think that's uh, possible. I don't think we have very good scenarios about the success of vaccination campaigns uh, globally. There are fundraising efforts right now by UNICEF, uh, by um, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, to make sure that those countries that need this vaccine most are able to access them. But the numbers are um, much less positive when we look outside of the Western world. Let me make an exception. Uh, South Asia is just doing fantastically well um, and has been a global leader in the pandemic and looking to their uh, efforts as global models for future pandemics is uh, something we should we should do. I mean, South Korea might be having a spike now or China, but just their success and the lack of attention they're getting in, in global media is uh, something to be concerned about. So I'm not concerned about that part of the world. They are the leaders here. On the topic of uh, future viruses, um, so this person says, as new viruses are expected, 
which agency is centralizing all of the intelligence coming out of the COVID crisis um, apart from uh, the World Health Organization. It used to be the case that the Americans were leaders. It used to be the case that the CDC um, was central, for example, to the eradication of Ebola and to so many other viruses that never really hit uh, the US and building up those national agencies, building up the European CDC, building up the Chinese CDC. Um, that's where the money is at the end of the day. The World Health Organization doesn't have the raw materials. It is merely a coordinating forum uh, so that scientists can move quickly from one country to another when a government might not want that. That's all really the, um, the World Health Organization could do. Uh, so building up those ties and building up those national agencies to their former status is a core goal. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a multi-part question. So as international organizations struggle to navigate global issues and hold countries who violate international law accountable, how do you see the ICC slash ICJ as do you see them as obsolete institutions? If countries do not adhere to the ICC slash ICJ rulings, does that say more about the ICC and the ICJ than it does about viola the violating countries and individuals? Can we move forward? Sorry, I think that was a bit confusing in my reading of it, but um, I hope you got the, the general. So there's a real question about who we can hold accountable and holding uh, the world's worst genocidal leaders accountable has been one of the key goals and accomplishments of the ICC and the ICJ. Uh, there's a question about what the goals of these organizations are. Is it to bring justice against particular perpetrators of mass atrocities? Is it to try to build uh, reconciliation in societies torn by civil war? Or is the goal deterrence such that the next leader uh, in a civil war thinks twice about the methods and techniques uh, he uses. I think uh, that to the extent we succeed on that last goal, to the extent we succeed in disseminating uh, the laws of war all the way down to uh, the lowest level soldier, all the way down uh, to uh, regular people and children who might be committing uh, acts of violence, we uh, succeed. I think there is some some benefit, uh, even when a particular leader is never uh, never comes within the um, jurisdiction of one of these tribunals against some, there, there is some more generalized uh, deterrence. I think, um, if you look at it from a pure kind of cost benefit analysis, these trials are putting very few people in jail for very, very much money. But if we try to think about what has been prevented, we can look at the international criminal court enterprise more optimistically. Thank you. And I'm just looking at the time now and we're getting close to the end of the hour. So that will be our final audience question to those of you who did not get to yours. I apologize, but um, this was a super engaging and informative discussion. So th thank you, Professor Alinos and Jerome. Uh, thanks again for all the work that you do leading the Young Professionals Board. Uh, if there's anybody interested in joining the Young Professionals Program, uh, please reach out to me. I'll send my email around in the chat. But uh, you all are doing really great work and we're lucky at the council to have you guys. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, okay, so um, Professor Leonis, Katarina, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out of your schedule to come share your insights with us on uh, this very, very uh, interesting and really much more controversial topic than, than maybe people realize. Um, Many of our members have expressed a lot of concerns about these international organizations as the questions have reflected. And I think um, it's, you've given us a lot to think about today. So thank you very much. And for the audience members, thank you all so much for joining us today and for your continuing support of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council. You can visit our website for more details on future events and to learn about joining the young professionals as Claire uh, had just mentioned. And our website, is lawacth.org. 
The council needs your support and continue to, uh, to continue offering these programs. So please consider becoming a member or making a contribution and a donation. Uh, so just to end, stay safe, stay informed, and we wish you and yours a happy holiday season.